Hello everyone, Alan Sens here again, and welcome to this segment on fusion weapon design. Now again, we're going to stay at a conceptual level here and not go too deeply into any engineering details. Uh, in fact, uh, we couldn't if we wanted to, because the precise design of fusion weapons remains a closely guarded secret, even to this day. So we have a pretty good idea what the basic conceptual nature of the design is, but we don't have a lot of details uh, on the precise uh, engineering of the weapon. So let's get started. So here's the learning objective for today's segment. When we are done, you should be able to describe the basic conceptual design of a fusion bomb. So if you're sitting around a table at dinner with your friends or your family and someone asks you, how does a fusion bomb work? You should be able to pull out a piece of paper and a pen and draw them basic schematic and describe how the bomb works. And because we covered it earlier, you should be able to do the same with a fission bomb design and you should be able to describe the differences between the two. Okay, so how do you build a fusion weapon? Well, uh, the first hydrogen bombs were based on a design developed by Edward Teller and Stanislav Ulam, known as the Teller-Ulam design. And this design is the basic concept for the design of all fusion weapons today. The leading scientific proponent of the hydrogen bomb was none other than Edward Teller. Now we've seen uh, Teller before, and here's a reminder of his, uh, his biography, uh, but Teller is sometimes called the father of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, after all, he encouraged the development of the hydrogen bomb, or what he called the super, even as the fission bombs were being developed in the Manhattan Project during World War II. Stanislaw Ulam is new to our story. Uh, he was a crucial collaborator on the development of the fusion bomb, and there continues to be something of a dispute on the respective contributions of Teller and Ulam to the project, even to this day. The mathematical obstacles to the development of the hydrogen bomb were considerable. The calculations required the largest math effort ever undertaken at that time, with Ulam and another scientist working out simplified versions of the necessary calculations by hand using a slide rule, paper, and pencils, if you can believe that. They did make use of the ENIAC, uh, the world's first electronic computer during the project, uh, but most of the calculations were done uh, by hand. The essential feature of the teller ulam fusion weapon design is the separation of the bomb into stages. The first, or primary stage, consists of a fission explosion. The energy released by this fission explosion triggers a fusion reaction in a secondary stage. So fusion weapons have a fission bomb as their trigger. Okay, so what do they basically look like? Well, I'm just gonna draw a basic schematic of a hydrogen bomb here. So this is the casing of the weapon. And the, that's, that's an M, um, the first part of a teller ulam design weapon then is the primary, and this is the fission bomb. So here in the bomb casing, we've got a fission bomb, which if you remember, has your highly enriched uranium or plutonium-238 at the center of the bomb, surrounded by explosives that when triggered will implode the fissionable material and that is how you get the detonation, right? The fission explosion out of a fission bomb. The second part of the weapon is the secondary and it is separate, right? It's a separate stage in the casing of the bomb. So here we have a uranium 238 casing, um, otherwise known as a tamper. At the center of that tamper, we have a plutonium rod 
or spark plug, as it is sometimes called. And then at the center here, we have a lithium deuteride fuel. So this is a combination of lithium and deuterium, and that surrounds the spark plug. And that lithium deuteride is the fusion fuel for the fusion explosion. Now, surrounding this assembly, on this area here, is polystyrene foam. So the secondary and the primary are embedded in this styrofoam, um, polystyrene foam, like this. Okay, now how does all this work? The fusion design works by exploding the fission primary uh, first. And so we have the fission bomb going off first, and when the fission bomb starts to detonate, it gives off x-rays. And those x-rays go through the entire bomb casing, like this. Okay. And what happens is when those x-rays actually um, go through the interior of the bomb, they heat the interior of the bomb and they cause the polystyrene foam to turn to a plasma. And when that happens, a tremendous amount of pressure is exerted inward against the lithium deuteride fuel and the plutonium spark plug. And what happens is the lithium deuteride is squeezed by about 30 times um, over its normal density and the shock waves from the fission explosion initiate fission in the plutonium spark plug. And the plutonium spark plug then starts to give off uh, radiation, heat, and neutrons. So our spark plug here at the center is now undergoing fission. And that fission is sending neutrons into the surrounding surrounding lithium deuteride. And what happens is when the neutrons go into the lithium deuteride, they combine with the lithium to make tritium. So now you've got deuterium and tritium inside this part of the bomb. And remember, that's how we get fusion. So the combination then of high temperature and pressure are sufficient for the tritium atoms to fuse with the deuterium atoms, which produces fusion. Now, a lot of descriptions of fusion bomb designs end right there, but there is actually a third component to the process. And what happens is when the neutrons from the fusion reactions um, start to uh, escape out into the casing of the bomb, um, they induce fission in the uranium-238 pieces in the tamper. Right, remember this section right here, this tamper. And so what happens is you start to get fission of the uranium-238 tamper. So many times you will hear these sorts of fusion designs described as fission, fusion, fission. Because you get fission here, you get fusion here, and then you get more fission as the fusion explosion causes fission reactions in the uranium-238 tamper. Fission, fusion, fission. And at this point, uh, the bomb explodes. Now remember, all of these events are happening in about 600 billionths of a second. Um, so uh, it's all happening extremely quickly. And of course, that makes both the physics, the math, and the engineering extremely challenging. Now, theoretically, uh, you could keep adding stages, right, to this. And uh, if you wanted, you could add another fusion stage, our plutonium spark plug, right, our uranium-238 tamper, and our lithium deuteride fuel. Okay, And you could stick this assembly into, presumably, a larger casing, a larger bomb. And what would happen then is you would get your fission primary going off, you would have your secondary go off, and then you would have a third tertiary stage go off as well, as this stage, this third stage, would be triggered by the second stage, which 
in of itself was triggered by the primary stage. So theoretically, you can keep adding stages and just get a bigger and bigger bomb. And that's why you'll often hear that there's no theoretical limit to the size of a fusion explosion. The largest test ever detonated was the Soviet Tsar Bomba test, which we'll talk about later in more detail. But it was probably a three-stage device, so it would have had the primary, the secondary, and a tertiary or third stage. Okay, let's review. So here is your basic fusion bomb design, right? You've got your primary right here, and it's a fission weapon with your plutonium or uranium hollow core, right, and your high explosive lenses. Down here, you've got your secondary, right? You've got your um, lithium-6 deuteride fusion fuel. You have your plutonium spark plug. And then everything is encased in this polystyrene foam casing. So when the bomb goes off, right, the first thing that happens is you get the fission explosion starting here as the primary explodes. You'll get x-rays coming from the fission bomb that irradiates and heats the interior of the casing. You will get the polystyrene foam turning to plasma and exerting pressure on the lithium deuteride fuel and the plutonium spark plug will then start to fission. And then you will get the fusion of the lithium and um, deuterium and tritium atoms um, inside the fusion part of the explosion and the bomb will go off. The first test of a hydrogen bomb occurred on November 1st, 1952. The bomb is codenamed Ivy Mike, um, and the so-called Mike shot had an explosive yield of 10.4 megatons. Uh, that's 10.4 million tons of TNT equivalent. It was a, a gigantic explosion. The fireball alone was 4.8 kilometers in diameter. And this is then just an illustration of just how massive the destructive potential of hydrogen weapons were and are. Okay, so I hope now uh, you're able to describe the basic conceptual design of a fusion bomb. Okay, um, so what does this all mean? Uh, well, what it means is that by harnessing the power of fusion, uh, scientists and bomb makers were able to produce a weapon that was capable of yields or explosive power into the megaton range or the tens of megaton ranges. Uh, fission bombs largely restricted to uh, tens or hundreds of kilotons. Still very large explosions, right, capable of destroying entire cities. But now, uh, with fusion weapons, we have these bombs capable of enormous destruction, and that really does begin to change many of the political elements surrounding the nuclear arms race during the Cold War, and that's something that we will get onto later. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you again soon.